Scotty Braun and AJ Perzinski with you for Legends Territory, part two of Doug Mankiewicz. Yes. Did you ever think of all of the people that we're talking to already, Doug Mankiewicz of all people would have a part two? Yes, Actually, I, I'm asking yes, the wrong person. Yes, because I know Doug and he won't <laughs> shut up and he'll tell, he'll tell you a lot of stories that most people won't say. That is very true. So if you caught part one, there was a lot on his lifelong friend, frenemy, A-Rod, <laughs> <laughs> uh, his longtime friend, AJ getting fake arrested. There was yes. a great story there as well. So we encourage you to listen back or watch back part one of this interview, either on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you to the MLB Players Alumni Association for setting up these interviews and putting this all together behind the scenes with us. And you can hit up baseballalumni.com for more info on your favorite former players. And without further ado, let's swing back to part two of Doug Mankiewicz talking to us. What was Jeter like? I mean, he he really never gave the media anything, but yet you're saying like, great guy to be around, fun, leading the room. Like you'd always hear that, but then, you know, he has vanilla ice cream when he would talk. And then, you know, he went into the game, of course. Now he's kind of back out for now, but I mean, he was, he was a big part of the running the Marlins for the last X amount of years. You're a Florida guy. So, so give me your lowdown on he just, back then and now. He just, I mean, like I didn't like him like growing up only because like I heard so much about him from Alex, right? Like you like these butt buddies and all this stuff, and I'm like, all right, like I get it. Like, but uh, just I had a I had an issue with the whole Yankee stigma growing up. My best friend at the time uh, was a diehard Yankee fan, and I just I got sick of it. Like I loved Don Mattingly was a player, but then I, like uh, whatever this Jeter guy, whatever. So like, <clears throat> and that's just me. It wasn't nothing he did. He was always respectful, and you know, as you play longer, you start to respect the fact that this guy's like the best ever. And like you get, like, I never forget my first day in spring training. Like we're, I went to the backfield to take ground balls, and he was there. And he's like, Doug, anything you need, like you know, New York, anything on or off the field, you let me know. And he was like that from day one. But I will say this, like, like he was a the, the consummate clown. Like I, I, I was totally blown away at how down to earth he was. I remember like fans would scream at him, Jeter, you suck, and he'd be like, I know, I'm trying my best. Like, but he would say it in a way like. He would talk to his front foot. I'm like, I can't get your foot down today. Like, I'm trying to get you down and you won't go down today. Like, just like stupid stuff like that. That It made him feel like, made, made me feel like, okay, so I'm not the only like idiot psycho out here that can't, that talks to himself and can't fix things. And I always felt like, like from afar, like you just said, like he was always a stoic and he always gave you nothing, gave you a lot of nothing. But like, he was super like, uh, he, the fact that he, was such a great player is one thing, but the fact that he kept that side from the world for most of the majority of his career, if not all of it, is is the number one Houdini act in the history of the world. Because, like I said, they, him and Posada would go at it every day, and they would get somebody in the middle and just try to like, get get in the middle of an argument and make somebody argue with somebody else. And it was awesome. Like I said, I, I was a little skeptical going to the Yankee clubhouse when I signed with them in 07, but – like I felt so at home, like they just were like, they weren't what I thought they were from afar. You always see like this business, like, you know, machine that just keeps going. And then like you get in the clubhouse and once the media's out, it's, I mean, I remember singing Mark Anthony, like they made me sing Mark Anthony riding a bike. Uh, you sang to me in like, in, a, in, a, in my Spanglish accent. Like I remember like Posada loved it. And I was like, well, that's just what I've always done. And and they, they just they like they wanted me to do it. And like I, you always think like those guys are just like Roger Clemens and Andy Pettit and the list goes Mo and the list goes on and on. You know, like they were just I never I, I couldn't believe how much fun and Derek had a lot to do with that. Derek was always, you know, you know, very humble in the sense of like he would make fun of himself, which if you guys obviously know baseball, like most baseball players are self-deprecating. We have to be with so much failure. And I, I was I, that was probably the biggest surprise of my career was seeing how Derek really was behind behind closed doors and how much fun he was. Doug, you managed – how long did you manage in the minor leagues? Like seven years, eight years. You did eight. A ball, double A, triple A? Or did A, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when we were in the minor leagues together, we were in Fort Myers in the instructional league, and you were trying to be a catcher? Mm -hmm. and, we, and we did a drill. It was like 5 o'clock in the morning, and they take us out on this field, and it's due, and – the grounds are wet, and our field coordinator at the time, Larry Corrigan, gives us a little paddle. Oh, okay. yeah. And he oh, says, yeah. no gear. I'm going to hit fungos at you guys from, from like, shortstop. And you, 
and I'm going to rifle these at you. And I want you to work on catching it like at a plate at the plate. The first one he hits. One-handed. Yeah, with a paddle, not even a glove. Hits Doug right in the shin. Okay. Goes fucking down. monster will. On the ground. He's like, I fucking hate catching. I'm never fucking catching again. Fucking okay. storms out of the field, drills <laughs> over. Same guy, Larry Corgan, same same instruction league, takes Doug and says, Doug, you look, you look fat, like shit you look in a uniform. Slow. You, need you look like smaller shit in a uniform. Yeah. You need smaller shoes. What size shoe you wear? He's like, nine and a half. And he's yeah. like, you're wearing nine and a half. So he took him and made him work because he said it would make him look faster. This is a true story. Mm-hmm. Made him look faster. Okay. Did you ever make any kids when you were managing in the minor leagues? No. A, do that drill, or B, wear small shoes to no. make it look faster. No, I did the drill. I did the drill with someone I didn't like. With I, I made him <laughs> get on his knees like the old Todd Walker drill, and I hit oh, yeah. fucking missiles at him. Just because I was like, you know what? If you're scared of the ball, one one thing's going to break. You're either going to quit, or you're going to learn how to field. One of the two. And uh, like Corrigan, I broke my foot because of that shit. By the way, because Corrigan, like oh, I asked the doctor, why my I played two years on a broken foot, and he's like. Well, I go, what causes this? He's like, oh, wearing too small of shoes. I'm like, motherfucker. Like, that's why I broke my damn foot. I remember, like, catching that day and with the freaking welt. You could, uh, like, it was, like, this big. It was the biggest welt I ever had in my shin. I couldn't get my, I couldn't buckle my shin guard. It was so big. And I looked down three innings later in the nine shoes he's got me, and then my toes breaking out the front. I'm like, man, this sucks. I want to go back to college. I hate this shit. Like this, <laughs> this is brutal. Like it's a thousand degrees. There's like gazelles running across the fucking field. It's a billion degrees. No, a thousand percent humidity. No wind. And I got this guy hitting missiles at me on the dew at four thirty in the fucking morning. I'm like, this is the dumbest shit I've ever done in my entire life. And you're over there laughing your ass off. <laughs> exactly it didn't right. in the fucking well, shit. And you know, right, because I went first and I shit can the drill because I ripped the freaking paddle <laughs> and was like, we're out of here. Catchers were going back inside. <laughs> <laughs> were, the, were the twins, or I don't know if you were the Tigers uh, at that point, like, were they pissed about it? Because I know, I mean, it, it's no, documented. We were, the twins. we were together. We, we were, were doing with, the drill together. I'm saying when he was oh, managing. He oh, yeah. Yeah. Because w- what ended up happening then, too? I mean, with the twins and the Tigers, you guys broke up. Oh, the Twins, like, we lost Terry Ryan. When Terry Ryan got fired, um, I interviewed for the big league job before they gave it to Bali. And, uh, you know, I had that same group. I had the Buxtons, the Polancos, Rosarios, Barrios, the list Kepler, the list goes on and on. I had all those guys all the way up. And I, I felt like that was my group. We won two championships in a row in the minor leagues. And people think in today's world that like you just win at the big league level it doesn't work that way. You got to set, you got to learn how to win in the minor league level, and eventually that group will win at the big league level. Um, I just felt like that group was mine. Um, I was hard on them for a reason because I felt like it was very similar to the group that AJ and I came up with. Um, we stayed together for the most part, and you saw the rewards of it in 02, 03, 04. So, um, but <clears throat> I mean. <laughs> The twins, they they, we changed, they changed the front office, and I kind of knew. And I went back to A-ball one year, and it just didn't work. And then Gardy went to the Tigers, and and I, I was getting kind of looked at for like a low A-ball job. And then they hired Gardy, and next thing I know, I'm getting called to do a triple-A job. And what was weird was um, I, I coached Toledo. Toledo Mudhens was the first was the first and only game I ever saw in my life. I was born there. Um, and I got to manage them. We made the playoffs, and then I got offered a two-year deal after that season, and I said, no, let's just do year to year, and they said, no, we want to give you two, and then I thought I did the most with the least amount of talent I've ever had, and they let me go, and they said I didn't discipline enough, which I thought was comical because if you ask any player I've ever had, uh, discipline is about the, my number one priority, uh, which, you know, I, you know, I had some run-ins with some guys and I had some run-ins with the front office over stuff that wasn't, I mean, we talked about the netting, the netting pretty much got me fired that goes around the field, which I thought was absolute bullshit. But, uh, um, you know, but I, 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 I thought about getting back into it and I was like, you know what? I haven't seen my son play enough baseball. I'm going to, I'm going to take a couple of years off. And if I get back into it, so be it. If I don't, so be it too. But, um, shit, I want to do this. This is, you guys got the, you guys got the life. This shit's easy. Yeah, it is. Just talking. <laughs> talking for life. That's it. It's, it's the absolute dream. You're yeah. right. No, you're right. Well, so with the Twins, you said, like, you you interviewed for the gig. You know, Buxton's talked about you publicly. Like, 
you know, you were a brother to him, super tight, felt like you just related to that group of next twins. So did he vouch for you? Like, how does that process work behind the scenes? I think they, those guys didn't have enough, didn't have enough skin in the game yet. I mean, they were still young players and they're still, it's funny, like when they all got called up, I think I'm marking my years wrong, but they first got called up and I got killed, right? For not teaching them how to do the things the right way. It's just the way that old adage, the minor league coaches are always shit and the big league coaches know everything. Well, that group went up there and they shit all over themselves at the big league level, which is going to happen when they're, when they're young. The next year they make the playoffs and I got that, which is fine. I, coaches don't get credit. I get it. You let the players tell you, thank you. You make you let, the, let the players say your name, not the coach say your name through a player. So I, I just funny. I got killed for not disciplining them and not teaching them the game and the fundamentals were bad and their base running was horrible. And then the following year, they're in Yankee Stadium in game one. And like, again, like, at least can I get at least a pat on the back? Like and like, at least take back all the shit you threw at me the year before about how they weren't ready. And uh, I, I mean, I, I I had Corey Seager early in his career with the Dodgers, uh, a joy to work with. Like I, I've had, and I still get texts from those guys. I still get video from those guys um, through my phone. And you know, Byron, you know, texts my son on on birthdays and stuff like that. And they, they stay in touch. So um, those guys will always be my guys. Polanco, Arias, all those guys. Um, I, I was lucky enough to be around them. And and saw what worked and saw what didn't work, but uh, I'm still I still have attachments to those guys because I want them to do well because they were not only not only great players but they're really good people and and like they deserve everything they get coming to them because I mean it's surprising that Buxton's doing as well as he is because I mean I, to me we developed him in, in the wrong fashion possible and thankfully he was just good enough to where his talent finally came out and uh, I still don't think that he's put it all together yet when he does it's going to be epic. Wait, what do you mean you developed them wrongly? Because now you – I was going to go somewhere else. We just moved them up and down so much. Like, they let them play a half. Like, not, this is not just Byron. This is a lot of the guys. Well, they let them play a half, and then they have success. At, 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 let's just say the Midwest League back when it was low A ball, right? They have a good half. Then they move them up to the Florida State League, and they have a half. And then if they have that half, they go to double A. It's like, well, the number one thing you always hear in baseball is what? you got to make adjustments. Well, in Byron's case – like, yeah, you throw him heaters in A ball, he's going to kill you, right? It's like we all knew the slider was his boo-boo, you know, it was his kryptonite. And, for example, I put him in the three-hole one night in A ball, and they were like, you can't do that. I'm like, well, why not? And they were like, well, we want him to hit leadoff. And I said, well, what's his number one problem? He, off-speed pitches. I said, you think he's going to get him in the one-hole? Like, if we put him in the three-hole, and he takes and he sees more sliders throughout his career to worry before he gets to the big leagues. He's going to be better in the big leagues because of this. And he's like, well, his numbers will suffer now. And I'm like, no one gives a flying shit what your A ball average is three, four years from now. They're not going to be like, wow, Byron's an all star, but man, he hit 227 in the Florida State League. No one cares about that. And the idea is sometimes these guys wrap their head around they want to get minor league numbers, which we all did. But at the same token, like, the more sliders he sees in the minor leagues, the better off he's going to be and the quicker he's going to make an adjustment at the major league level. So and that, that's the kind of the fight you go back and forth with. And it's like I always joke around. It's like it's I, I hate to say this, but it's like sometimes dealing with some of these people, it's like you're trying to describe the color blue to a blind person. It's just they don't get it. Like they don't understand what we we don't need. Baseball guys don't need a number to tell us what our eyes already tell us. And what can work and what can't work. I thought the smartest thing, Mike Radcliffe, bless his heart, you know, rest in peace, sir, was one of the best baseball minds I was around. And one year he had Chad Allen and I work on draft, on the draft, because they wanted to take some hitters. And it was the first time working there, I felt like, okay, we're finally getting somewhere as an organization because we're the ones that are going to have to fix it, right? You can tell if a swing is going to work, if there's something's, just every swing has a chance to be fixable, but not to a certain degree. And he finally let us in on going, okay, well, this is easier to fix than that. Like, this looks like it can work. We can do something like this. This is a great base. Let's take this kid. Um, and you just, you, you fight, you buck heads. I mean, I remember I called the University of Florida coach on one of their players. Um, and I'm, AJ, help me out. What, what's, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Well, uh, Brad White. 
Oh, no, Whitesmith. Brad White, smartest scout in the league, dude. What are you talking about? Now, he smartest was smartest scout in the history of the world. He drafted drafted Brooklyn. drafted you and I. <laughs> right, fucking genius, right? You should be. They should be on the. Mount should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, so I would call on him. We call on one guy, like one of the outfielders, and Brad's like, "You're missing the wrong guy. Like, you're missing." Because I love the first, I love Alonzo. I thought he was as much, as much as it pains me to love a Gator. I was like, this dude just gets it. And Brad was like, this guy was going to hit his way to the big leagues. He's a hard worker. Da da da. I went back and I said, what about the Alonzo guy? And uh, they're like, oh, we have him at fifty one. And I'm like, that's a big drop. <laughs> like, okay. I'm like, but uh, here's a guy who was in pro ball for how long? scouted forever was with him every day if there's one guy i'm going to take the advice of he worked for the twins forever when brad tells you something you you believe it and you take it and you run with it and you know now he's with the mets and you see he's got 18 home run derby championships and hits 50 a year um but that's just the the dynamic you have in pro Bowl now it's like you if you can't quantify it with a number they don't even listen to you so it's like it's frustrating as hell because you know, you're you're not a coach; you're a babysitter, and that's the hard part. And that's some of it. Some of it's, you know, you spend most of your time behind a computer screen. You're like, when do I get hit a fungo to him? When do I get to go work in the cage? Like, I can't make kids get here at nine a.m. for a seven o'clock game. So, um, I mean, it, I, I miss my guys in Minnesota, but you know, I, I said I got to see my son play a little bit, which has actually worked out pretty good. Well, well since you've since you've now you're no longer coach in the minor leagues and you did win a gold medal, can you become the coach of the USA team so you can take me to like Japan, Korea, I don't know, Taiwan, somewhere? I'd love to. Know? I'll be your. I'm actually coach. doing. I'm doing some the stuff. Bullpen coach. And I trust me. That's why I was like the, the WBC team, and that's probably why I didn't get the job in Minnesota because Terry Ryan was like, "Who's going to be your staff?" And I was like, "Well, AJ is my bench coach. <laughs> that's an automatic DQ." Coach. And and and. Terry like giggled, and I'm like, "Why would you pick those guys?" I said, "You know why? I because because AJ would be the first person to be like, that's a really fucking stupid idea, like that's really bad, like that's let's not do that." And I like I, he's not afraid to tell me no. Latroy is not afraid to tell me no. Like the baseball dudes, to be like, I trust them, and if I'm about to do something really stupid, I really want their honest opinion. I don't want just everybody who's going to just agree with me. And so that being said, I actually do stuff with the 18U national team the last couple of years. I'm doing it again this year. Cuddy's our manager for the 18U team. And I keep pushing it because I'm like, man, I, I like to go travel abroad a little bit. Let's, let's, you know, you can have the WBC. I'd rather just go to South Korea and wherever it is, you know, Japan hey, they again. You, hey, they don't let you in South Korea after that home run you hit in the 2000 Olympics. You oh, might, I'll get shot. You might have sure. your picture on the wall and be like, you're not let this idiot in. Uh, I'm, in I'm on those balloons. <clears throat> That's, they, they can't stand me over there. It's the only place in the world I can't go. I blacked out <laughs> twice in a matter of four days, and that's they, 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 they can't stand. They think I'm Babe Ruth. That's how fucked up they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so last one here, and I know you were like, oh, I didn't do shit for them, but come on, you caught the last out of the 04 World Series. The ball. The, the baseball had some controversy to it. You also played go. with, I would say, a movie-like fratty clubhouse scene craziness. We we talked recently with Johnny Damon about it. So so give me the goods on all of that. All right. So I, I never forget, like, the Friday night, we're playing the Red Sox. I'm still with the Twins. And Nomar comes up to me. He's like, I heard we might be teammates soon. And I'm like, that'd be great. Because, <clears throat> I mean, like, the Twins, they already got rid of AJ. And, like, the Rat Pack was gone for us there. Me, AJ, Denny Hawking. Like, I just, like, it wasn't my team anymore. I felt like it's, it had tore even, but it just didn't feel right. So I was like, all right, that'd be cool. Um, and then the deadline comes, and it comes and goes. And I'm still a twin. And then we had a five, we had a weird start time, like 5 o'clock Saturday night game. And I took BP with the twins. And <clears throat> I, I'm in the middle of talking to the all three Minneapolis beat writers about how me and Guard are going to have to make this relationship work. Um, and they tap me on the shoulder and I go into Guardy's office and Terry Ryan's sitting in there. And he's like, damn you two for putting me in this situation. But Doug, we traded you to the Cubs. And I was like, well, fuck. I think I heard I was nice in August because they had Derek Lee. <laughs> and, uh, and so he goes, then they traded you to Boston. And I was like, I picked my shit up and like, I rolled behind the clubhouse, like behind the two clubhouses in the Metrodome, there was a, a laundry room that connected the clubhouses. I walked right behind there. 
And I walk in and Pedro's butt naked sitting on my chair, like swinging back and forth going, Dougie, come give me a hug. And like Nomar's packing his bag. I'm like, oh, this is, I go, uh, I go, I thought I was a good player, but I'm nowhere near Nomar's caliber. And I didn't know Orlando Cabrera was in the deal yet. So I had no idea. And I walk in, I'm like, holy shit. Like, did I just get traded for Nomar Garcia Parra? These guys are fucking idiots. <clears throat> so, um, it, and I, I found out Orlando's in the deal too. So I was, I couldn't have walked into a better clubhouse than that one. Uh, knowing Johnny, Veritek, all those guys played against those guys in college, high school, whatever. Um, a funny quick anecdote on that one. I was the only guy in the Metrodome that lost all three games that weekend. Uh, the Red Sox beat the Twins in, on Friday night. And Saturday and Sunday, the Twins beat the Red Sox. So I was the only guy on the field that lost all three games that weekend. <laughs> Um, that tells you something else that I'm, you know, that's how good a player I was. Uh, then, so like just every day in the, every day in the Red Sox clubhouse, you saw shit that was like, if we were, could have been a reality show, we'd all be like famous as hell just because you walked in and, you know, besides the fact that everybody else wore everybody else's shit besides their Jersey, like your undershirt, your pants, your socks, whatever it was, if you got three hits the night before, you better get to the field at 10 because your pants are gone for sure. Manny would have Billy Miller's pants on all the time. Um, you walk in and you walk in and there's like Pedro's midget sitting there. You walk in the like go walk to the training room and there's three dudes in one of those little ass splashing each other with soap, like in one of those like mini, like whatever those hot tubs. And just like, and you just walk past it like, hey, Kev, Manny, David, how you doing? Like, you know, it just, it was a daily occurrence. It was just one big traveling shit show um and it was that's why to me why we won um we tried to do it right the first three games against the yankees we all went home got your sleep and we were like fuck it and i david and i bless his heart we get beat whatever it was 19 to 8 and game three it was like we're not going out like this and david goes come to my house I'm like all right cool so next thing you know we're drinking el presidente's and it's like 7 15 in the morning we're still drinking. And I'm like, David, like, we, we got to stop. And he's like, we're fucking doing it our way. And we, I think we got rained out the next day, thank God. But the next day, we ended up winning. And it, it was just a most amazing run I've ever been a part of to where it was like, there were so many little pieces of that series that, I mean, people forget the ball Tony Clark hit. If it rolls one more stitch and stays in the park, we lose just shit like that, that like people think of the Robert Steele, which was monumental. Don't get me wrong, but obviously it was huge, but like little things like that, or uh, there's so many little tiny quirky little things that had to go right that did. And then once St. Louis came around, it was like, it was like a, the world series, honestly, after that Yankee series was like a Tuesday day game against the fucking tigers. It was the most boring, like outside of game one, where we had a lead, lost it. And then came back. I don't know, Manny was always the best. Like Manny thought, if I broke in his gloves, he would be a better fielder. So he'd always give me his outfielders bits. Like Dougie, break this in. All right. And if you remember that with that game one in Fenway, he comes flying in and does one of his slides, and he takes out like a chunk of sod. Shouldn't have dove forty. Dove feet first. We just blew like a six-run lead, and he comes and sits down next to me, and he's like, Dougie. The grounds crew hates my guts. And I'm like, man, it's the fucking World Series, dude. Like, I need this for, like, my Christmas. Like, you need to lock it the fuck in. <laughs> like, I know. And he's like, Poppy, no problem. We got it. But I'm like, that's that's where his mind was in the middle of the game. Like, Dougie, the, like, I've just lost the gold glove. And the grounds crew hates my guts because he missed the ball. <laughs> it's just like, but that's how they were. And not the only other story I can have on the season, and AJ, you can vouch for this. We're in Seattle. We have bases loaded. And Veritek's up. And Manny's at second and Johnny's at third. One out. We're in a pennant race, right? We're, we're battling, trying to win the wild card, trying to win the division. Veritek's a free agent at the end of the year. And this is like September. So Tech gets a fly ball to left. Now, Dale Swam's coaching third. Johnny's tagging up. Adrian Belche's playing third. Manny thinks there's... Two like two outs runs through the three other people that are standing at third base just runs right past them 
scores, high fives the next guy, walks back to the dugout, has no idea there's only one of them. So everybody's like, what, Manny, what the fuck are you doing? So the next half inning comes in, Manny comes in and he goes, uh, Jason, you're you're a free agent. I keep your price tag down. I want you to be a Red Sox next year. And the whole dugout fell out fucking crying and laughing. Like that situation in a heated game in a pennant race, most guys would just argue and bitch and what the fuck? And that's us. And like Frank Conan looked over and was just like giggled. It's like that's just the truth. Like that's what that's how Manny thought. Like he totally fucked up, but yet he literally that's where he came and like even Veritech, who hit it, was like there's nothing to do but laugh. And they, we all meant it. It was really fucking funny. But that's that why that's why that group survived. And that's, I mean, to win in that place with that circumstance, like I saw grown men, like grown men in groups of four to six, like hyperventilating, crying, walking outside of Fenway that night after game three. And you're like, man, I wish I cared that much about something I had no control over. I mean, I get it. I'm a Dolphins fan. I, I, I live it every fucking summer, every, every winter. But like to be that emotional over, uh, you know, that's when it really hit me. Like, holy shit! Like, this is a huge deal. And to end up winning the way we did was was pretty freaking awesome. And I, I I felt bad for the guys the year before getting their heart ripped out. The you know, Wake getting his heart ripped out, and their guys having to go through that on Yankee Stadium. And to, and, to, and to finish it Game Seven on on in Yankee Stadium meant the world to us. And I I know it uh, it couldn't happen to a better group of people. Hey, we can't let you go. I mean. If you remember, when you guys won, the night you guys won in St. Louis, I texted you or I called you and I said, I hope you got the fucking ball. Let's put that bitch on eBay right now. And you said, no, nah, hell no, I'm keeping it. I'm like, dude, we can make a lot of money on this thing. <laughs> you, we, yeah. Like, yeah, oh, we. Oh, we. We were a team. We, were we a team. oh, yeah. We're, uh, fuck yeah, yeah, we, we're, we're a team on that one. I literally <laughs> called him and said, hey, I'll be, I know you got the ball because he caught it and he threw it in his pocket. And I said, we need to put that thing on eBay right now. And he's like, I'm keeping it. So where where is the ball? Because the ball caused a crazy uh, yeah. controversy. But where Death is the threats. ball? And didn't you you leased it, right? But do you still have technically ownership of it? Death threats, death threats, all kinds of shit. Um, I joked around and said I caught the final out of game two and game four. Which one did I give back? So uh, well, which one did you give back? That's a good question. <laughs> Nobody will ever know. No. <laughs> Wait, so you 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 gave him game two instead of game four? No, no, I gave him. <laughs> so we'll uh, never, just trying to clarify. Hey, we'll never know. You'll never know. Wow. No, uh, I, no, I, I leased it to him and gave it to the Hall of Fame. And I, I guess the whole thing for me was I literally had it authenticated right by Larry Lucchino in the clubhouse. Like, he's like, oh, is that the ball? I'm like, yeah, it's right here. And, like, the guy put the sticker on it, and all right, man, cool. I just didn't want it to end up in some ball bag. And now we're hitting, taking BP, you know, in fucking Fort Myers with it two years later. So I put it in – I had it in my glove, and got it came back, and next thing you know, it's like Shaughnessy like, had an article, wanted to write an article on me and Kevin Millar's relationship – through the whole trade stuff, because Theo was going to trade one of us because we all both wanted to play every day. And Kevin and I would talk and be like, well, where are you going today? Like, well, I'm going to the Mets. Where are you going? The Marlins, da, da, da. And the last 10 seconds of the conversation was, hey, do you still have the ball? I'm like, yeah, of course I do. Like, And then Shaughnessy goes, I bet you that could fetch a pretty penny. And I'm like, probably. And I go, maybe I'll put my kids to Florida State. Well, I didn't have kids at the time. And Florida State at the time was like three grand. It was like it was like tongue in cheek, and I remember working out the next morning because I was going to the Bahamas uh, to fish a tournament, and I got like crazy amount of text messages and missed calls. I'm like, oh shit, somebody died. Like, what's the problem? And come to find out, you know, McCavish won't give ball back. I'm like, what? And the 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 worst part about it was, so they didn't want me to sell it to make money. Well, understandably so. Well. The Jimmy Foundation, the Jimmy Fund, is on the you know beyond the Green Monster, whatever. And Lucchino called me. He was like, I, he wanted to put it in the Fenway, whatever Hall of Fame, so that people would pay to come see it. And I was like, well, you're gonna charge people to come see it, right? And he's like, yes, of course. And I go, well, why don't you put? I want a dollar to every ticket you sell to go to the Jimmy Foundation in honor of the players. His exact quote to me was, "Players don't tell us what to do with our money." And I was like. Okay, motherfucker, you ain't fucking getting it then. 
So that's kind of how, and then I became the villain. And it's like a, it's like a, it's like an urban legend. Like there's people that still work at Fenway that have no idea what goes on. And, you know, we'll save it for another episode because I have a really good story on the ball that, uh, <laughs> that Brian Buchanan's involved in it. It's a freaking oh phenomenal one. But oh I, I just, and like then two years later, a year later, I find out I'm in Key West and I'm reading the paper, which I never do. And I look in this thing and says, McCavage to be sued for World Series ball. I was like, sick, like awesome. So now I'm getting sued for it. But I was under the impression that if the Hall of Fame wants something, they come to you and they say, hey, you know, we'd like to have that. I didn't know the protocol because, I mean, shit, nothing I ever had was ever going to go to Cooperstown. So I didn't know any of that shit. So um, I was like waiting for them to call and be like, hey, we'd like to have it. And they never did. So finally, I learned the protocol and I, I ended up giving it to the Hall of Fame. That's where it belongs anyways. But um, like I said, there's a lot of a lot of just I, I didn't wear my World Series ring for like two years because I was like, fuck these guys. And then I thought about it like, well, the people that I'm arguing with like really had nothing to do with it. It's the players. So I was going to, you know, I was like, all right, I, I, I finally put it back on. I had better taste in my mouth, but it just was, it was a shit show from the start and could have been handled way differently. And uh, on both parts, my end too, but uh, you know, I wouldn't change it for anything. I, I think you're going to have a movie just on the ball controversy alone yeah. that you might make. We got one of those coming point. hopefully on the, on the, on the Olympic team. We're actually no, working no on shit. that. I've been doing that for a couple summers. Um, uh, Dave Finucci wrote a book, uh, Miracle on Grass. And Ted Collins has, has wrote this, written the screenplay. It's been so great for us to, to write it. And, and we're looking for investors. And we've been fighting it for a couple summers now. And it's tough with everybody's schedule. But we've been kind of bouncing around and going back and forth. And we'd like to, you know, we've been pitching it to everybody we can that we've, we've met with a lot of people. Um, trying to get it to where it's done right and the, the story be told um, the right way. And I think, you know, I, you look at the success that the Miracle had with the hockey team, and there's a lot of similarities to that team and what we did and what we accomplished in Sydney. And um, the screenplay is fantastic. And we're looking forward to, you know, in the near future, you know, finally putting that thing on a screen and so everybody can really understand what we did and, and how we did it. I, I agree. I would love to watch that. And hey, I mean, this was entertaining as hell. So just a shout out, as we always do, good stuff from the MLB Players Alumni Association for making this happen, behind the scenes. Baseballalumni.com for much more info on your favorite former players and new episodes of this show, Legends Territory, every week on Foul Territory's YouTube channels and wherever you get your podcasts. AJ said, why is he on? Legendary interview. That was good <laughs> shit, man. That was fun. That's what I'll never forget. Skip, Skip Bayless said that. Like he's like, oh, he, someone asked him about me. He's like, oh, he's 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 a, he's phenomenal. And he goes, quote. And he goes, I think he's a horseshit player, but he's a has phenomenal quotes. So I'm like, see, honesty. I love it. See, I appreciate that. Thank <laughs> well, he wasn't you. wrong. Like, that's he wasn't wrong. He might have he might have under he might have overvalued as a player, but it's okay. Phenomenal, phenomenal. <laughs> the gold glover. Doug, thanks again, man. You guys, anytime. <laughs>